Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for the record, my name is Henry Santana, at-large city councilor, and I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Education. Um, today is March 11th, 2024. Um, this hearing is being recorded. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. Rain comments may be sent to the committee email at um, ccc.education at boston.gov and will be made part of the record and available to all counselors. Public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. Individuals will be called on in the order in which they are signed up and will have two minutes to testify. If you are interested in testifying in person, please add your names to the sign-up sheet near the entrance of the chamber. If you are looking to testify virtually, please email our central staff liaison, Shane Pack, at shane.pack at boston.gov for the link and your name will be added to the list. Today's hearing is on docket number 0177, order for a hearing reclaiming the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center for our Boston Public Schools athletes. Councilors Aaron Murphy, Benjamin Weber, and Tanya Fernandez-Anderson are referred to and, and referred to the committee on, on January 24, 2024. Today I'm joined um, by my colleagues in order of arrival, um, Councilor Aaron Murphy, Councilor um, Tanya Fernandez-Anderson, Councilor, Councilor Weber, Councilor Julia Mejia, and Councilor Fitzgerald. Um, I would like to, <clears throat> I would like to now introduce today's panelists. Um, I appreciate you all being here. Um, Jackie um, Jenkins Scott, um, President of Roxbury Community College. Um, Michael Turner, Executive Director um, of the Reggie Lewis um, Track and Athletic Center. Jordan Smock, um, Executive Director of Communications, Marketing and Exter External Affairs, Roxbury Community College. Um, Marta Rosa, Interim Executive Vice President and Special Assistant to the President of Roxbury Community College. Um, and Ted, Lo Ted Loska, Track and Field Coach, Boston United Track and Cross and Country Club. On behalf of the Education Committee, my thanks to our panelists for joining us today. Um, I want to acknowledge that the sponsors invited um, two people from um, BPS to join us today um, as the panelists, uh, the Senior Director of Athletics and the Athletic um, Director of Tech Boston Academy. Um, those two BPS staff members are unfortunately unable to join us today, um, but as chair, I feel that we can move forward with a productive conversation with the RCC panelists and my council colleagues to discuss the Reggie Lewis and its availability for the use of BPS students, which is the focus of the order filed by the sponsors for today's hearing. Um, I'll start with a quick overview of our, proce of our proceedings today. Um, to foster productive com um, conversation focused on the Reggie Lewis and its utilization by BPS students, I'd like to provide RCC, um, I would like to provide the RCC President and Reggie Lewis, ex um, Lewis Executive Director an opportunity to offer opening remarks and an overview of BPS usage of the facility. Um, then Coach Led, um, Ted Loska will have the opportunity to provide an opening statement um, and then we can move to opening statements and questions from my council colleagues. Um, with that, I ask RCC President Jackie Jenkins Scott to start us off. Good afternoon. Okay. Yeah. okay. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us with um, you this afternoon. We are delighted to be here to talk about the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletics Center. As you mentioned, I am Jackie Jenkins Scott, one correction counselor. I'm interim president of Roxbury Community College. Uh, the college will be appointing a permanent president in the, over, in the next few months, hopefully, um, certainly by the beginning of the fiscal year. The Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center is an important resource at Roxbury Community College, and I appreciate the commitment to the center the college and the Boston residents that we serve. The Reggie Lewis Center is perhaps the most well-known and highly regarded facility at Roxbury Community College. The center is unique in Massachusetts and I would say the country, as it is the only statewide facility for public high school track. The center was established in 1973 through legislative mandate, Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Massachusetts legislative mandate, there is only one general law guiding 
the operations of the center. This general law, part one, chapter 6B, section 22A, mandates that the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center serve as a statewide facility for public high school track and field, RCC athletics and wellness, and for use by members of the abutting residential neighborhoods in our area, and finally, for use by the public at large. Although the state law governing the center necessitates that all high school track and field programs across this Commonwealth have priority use at the center, our data shows that due to proximity and RCC's longstanding partnership with the Boston Public Schools, BPS students, faculty, and administrators use the facility more frequently than others across the Commonwealth. From December 22 to the present, an average of five high schools and approximately 20 student athletes per school have benefited from practicing at the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center weekdays from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. This track season, BPS athletes hosted eight meets at the center, which is greater than any other league in Massachusetts. The number of meets hosted by other leagues uh, at the Reggie. During this track season, 491 PP BPS athletes participated in MSTCA invitational meets, which are held almost, almost every weekend from December through the end of February. From December 2021, when the, track, when the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center reopened after the closing due to COVID-19, since that time, 98 uh, BPS athletic events have been held at the Reggie. Events include track meets, cheerleading competitions, basketball tournaments, and many more. 23 non-athletic BPS events have been held at the Reggie during the same period. These events include STEM fairs, new education institutes, a citywide science and engineering fair, and many more. In addition to the events that are contracted directly with BPS, City of Boston departments regularly hold events at the center. Recent examples include the annual Hispanic Heritage Month Senior Luncheon, Citizenship Day, and Boston Public Health Commission's Summer Enrichment Program. In fact, this Friday, Boston Public Health Commission is holding a major conference that will be both at the college and at the Reggie Lewis Track and Center uh, from, uh, I think it's Friday and Saturday. Uh, over 500 people anticipated coming. Although the Reggie Lewis uh, Center is scheduled extremely full during the track season, which runs from late November to early March, we recently partnered with the Department of Conservation and Recreation, DCR, to accommodate groups displaced by the repurposing of the Millennia Cast Complex through our partnership. We found practice time on Saturday mornings for the Boston United Track Club, space for the Wilson uh, Fitness Program, and time for seniors from the area to walk the track. We pride ourselves in, on being good neighbors and good citizens, and we we always do our very best to make sure the center is available to the greater Roxbury community. In fact, on an annual basis, we host over 30 events organized by Boston-based nonprofits and CDCs at the Reggie. Serving, at all of our, serving all of our constituents effectively is certainly a balancing act. And we always op we're always open to hear new ideas about how we could improve access and operations. When I began my tenure as interim president, I convened the Pathway Forward Committee for the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center to assess the current state of operations and offer areas for improvement. One of the recommendations from the Pathway Forward report is to establish an advisory committee with representation from all of the Reggie Lewis Center's constituents to regularly meet and provide recommendations to RCC's president and board of trustees. RCC's new executive director with me today, Michael Turner, 
is hoping to establish this committee by the end of this year. We welcome your input on the structure of the advisory committee. If you would like to recommend committee members, uh, please let us know. Another critical recommendation from the Pathway Forward Committee is to address the deferred maintenance at the Reggie Lewis Center. Our most recent facility assessment indicates that the Reggie Lewis Center is in need of $20 million in repairs and that the most important repairs are replacing the roof and the outdated HVAC system. The HVAC system is a huge concern of ours. If the HVAC system is not functional, we cannot operate that building. We spent the last year advancing for a line item in the state budget for these critical repairs with RCC's legislators and the governor. Unfortunately, our efforts uh, were, did not yield the results we hoped. We are cautiously optimistic that our continued efforts will result in some funding, hopefully in the 2025 state budget. However, it's unlikely that we'll receive the full 20 million needed uh, for all the repairs at the Reggie. Presently, uh, BPS athletes, like all high school track and field leagues, do not pay for the center for practice, for practice times or meets as required by the en enabling legislation. BPS and all city departments receive a 10% discount on space when um, renting the facility. RCC students, faculty and staff, many of whom are your constituents, use the center free of charge. The center's annual appro appropriation is 1.125 million and the retained revenue account is presently capped at $529,000 a year. We are not receiving funding, funding from DCAM for these deferred maintenance um, that I referred to. Councilor uh, Fernandez Anderson recently uh, recommended that the council explore opportunities to provide RCC and other community groups with grant funding to provide health and wellness programs for city youth at the center. We think that Councilor Fernandez, uh, we thank you uh, for this uh, innovative idea, Councilor, and new sources of revenue are essential if we are to increase community access to the center. In closing, we thank you again for the opportunity to answer questions and present the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center, which is a gem in this community and important to Roxbury Community College, important to Boston Public Schools, and important to the city. We welcome your questions now. Thank you, President um, Duncan Scott. I would like now to um, ask um, the Executive Director, Michael Turner, to provide an opening statement. Um, before you start, I'd like to just add um, that is my understanding that you have been working on updated usage policies for the Richard Lewis since joining the team around five months ago. And um, President Jenkins Scott also just noted um, plans to establish an advisory committee to regularly, to regularly meet and provide recommendations to the president and board. So I'd just like to ask um, that you speak to any policy updates that have been recently um, been put in place or will be put in place soon that might impact BPS students' usage and any progress you can share on plans for the advisory committee. Um, with that, Director Turner, please proceed. Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, everyone, for having us here. Uh, right now, we are starting meetings with a few individuals this week to discuss names and structure for the advisory committee. So our plan is, is starting that as quickly as possible with the intent to finalize the, um, the committee within the next coming months. But uh, so we are definitely starting our process, actually have a meeting tomorrow um, regarding that. So we're, we're, we're getting that started and want to have it in place as quickly as possible. Uh, as far as nothing to add to the opening statements by President Jenkins uh, Scott, um, I will um, say, well, sorry, what was the other statement or question you wanted me to oh, answer? Any opening, if okay. you want to add anything. No, I think, I think we've, um, you know, we've been doing our very best since we got here um, to make sure that we are um, creating access for everybody. Uh, Mr. Community Center, statewide high, high school track and field location, um, and field home of RCC Athletics. So we've been doing everything where can, our can, we can to create a standard operating procedure. So we want to make sure um, that going into the next season, each league has a memorandum of understanding 
And right now, that was something that wasn't in place um, previously. So we are moving forward um, with creating that uh, documentation right now so we can start reviewing it with each league, um, including the MSTCA, MIAA, to make sure that everyone understands what role who is playing as we move forward into the next track season. Our goal is to have that completed by um, the end of the summer. So as we start scheduling um, the track meets in the fall, everybody is, is on the same page and is documented on how we're operating and um, who's providing what resources to, to operate these track meets. Right. Well, thank you, Director um, Turner. Um, I'd like to provide Coach Loska with the opportunity to make an opening statement, if you'd like. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, my name is Ted Loska, and I've kind of been a coach for forever, I guess. I wish I had a better re prepared statement. Uh, <clears throat> I do coach the, uh, the Boston United Track Club, who, you know, really, really, really appreciate uh, the access to the Reggie Lewis Center. Uh, hopefully here shortly when the track season is over, we won't have to get everybody up at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, little kids aren't that good at getting up in the morning. We're looking forward to being able to practice at 9 o'clock. Uh, that being said, I, I also go back to the day the Reggie Lewis Center was opened, and I remember track practices back then. And uh, we had track practices until about 5.30 every night of the week, and we had two meets. Uh, as time went by, that time was shortened uh, generally about 15 minutes a year until we are now, uh, some people say 4 o'clock, but I will tell you at least half the time, uh, 3.30 was the get out time at uh, Reggie Lewis Center. This is okay for the athletes that I mostly coach out of the John D. O'Brien and a, a few from Madison Park because they just get out of school at like 2 o'clock or a quarter to 2 and run right over and they get like an hour, hour and a half, which is barely adequate, but okay for practice. But it leaves out uh, all the schools that don't get out at quarter to two and have to travel halfway across the city. And while it's, it's understandable that you can train track athletes running up and down the hallway, but only the runners. You can't train long jumpers running up and down the hallway. And I can tell you firsthand that there's no place to throw shot put in a school. And if you doubt me, go to your local school and ask where you can throw shot put. Gym's it out because it's basketball season. So, you know, that being said, when we did start the track season, uh, we had a couple nights where we were there till five because there were no suburban meets. And what would happen is, oh, by the way, I coach throwers. So I'm in the corner of the, of the track. People don't really ever come over there much and I never go see them much. Uh, but what would happen is around four o'clock, the uh, O'Brien kids and uh, 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 Latin Academy kids are also close enough to get over. Uh, they all start wrapping up their practice and I keep thinking, okay, I'm going home. And then I look up and the kids who get out at, you know, like 3.30 or four o'clock are starting to show up. And it allowed me a chance to work with them on throws too. And once the track season started, I never saw them again. And I want to tell you, there's some very talented, uh, potentially talented kids who come from Tech Boston and uh, I'm trying to remember the new mission and uh, a couple of the other schools, Burke, a couple of places that don't get out until 3.30. So what, what I would like to see is a way to accommodate those athletes so they can get access to a track where they can practice the throws and the jumps. Uh, the high jump is also something that generally doesn't happen at everybody's high school either. Uh, and there must be a way that we can uh, accommodate those high school kids. They have every bit of a right to uh, access the track as anybody else does, I think. Uh, that being said, I really love the Reggie Lewis Center. Uh, the Reggie Lewis Center does something that nothing else in Roxbury has managed to do, and that's bring everybody from Massachusetts, the suburbs included, into Roxbury. When I first moved here, you couldn't get a suburban kid to come to Roxbury on a bet. Their, if they were interested in doing it, their parents wouldn't allow it. I can tell you, if you want the stories, I can be happy to tell you. I was a swimming coach back then, and uh, yes. So anyway, I love the fact that the Reggie Lewis Center has you know, brought the whole state to see that Roxbury isn't what they thought it was, 
and that it is a vibrant place and wonderful place to be. I love seeing high school kids running up and down um, uh, Malcolm X Boulevard. It's just, you know, kind of warms my heart. That's my opening statement, I guess. Oh, great. Thank you, Coach Loska. Um, I'd like now to recognize my council colleagues for their opening remarks and order of arrival. I'm sure we're all looking um, to get into questions, so I'd like to, uh, that we can limit open remarks to two minutes um, so we can reserve more time for questions and discussions. Um, we'll give the floor now to Councillor um, at large, Eric Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for being here. You may sense that I'm frustrated. It's no way frustration towards any of the panelists in front of me. I'm upset that BPS did not notify me as the lead sponsor, or I don't know if they notified my colleagues, but that they were not going to send Avery Esdale, the Senior Director of Athletics. This meeting was not in any way supposed to be adversarial to Roxbury Community College or the great work you do at the Reggie Lewis Center, which I know firsthand um, being there. Um, Anyone who knows back in March of 2022, two years ago, just months after taking office, I filed a hearing order to address the lack of athletic opportunities that our BPS students have and have continued since then to advocate that our students in our schools have what they need to be successful. As an educator for 24 years, my children benefited from being on sports teams. I know how important it is that our children in the city have access to these opportunities. They absolutely um, don't, that does not mean that they need to take times away from um, school communities. It's a state building, while well aware of that, and other people use the Reggie. Was hoping that the conversation would be with BPS Athletics to talk about how we're going to move forward and be more committed to our students. We spend the most per student in the country for a city public school. We spend $35,000 per student and we only spend $76 per student on athletics and extracurricular activities. To me, it's one of the reasons we're failing so many of our kids in the city of Boston. So in no way does that lack of investment on BPS put a burden or should ever put a, a negative um, light on to Roxbury Community College or the great work you do um, at the Reggie. So not really sure where this conversation will go without BPS's voice here. They're the only administrative um, panelists that should be here. They didn't show up two weeks ago to a hearing about what's gonna happen in our BPS community center schools with you know programming happening with camps and pools shut in the summer. Just hoping that prior to council meetings that they're just more open to us who they're gonna send as panelists. But I do appreciate the background information. I do appreciate the, the work you do to make sure that the Reggie continues to be a gem. And the same reasons I advocated to not move the O'Brien would be the same reasons I'll continue to support you in advocating that we invest in making sure the Reggie stays a wonderful um, asset to our city and to the state as a whole. But I do see those buses pull up, and I do remember when people didn't want to come to that area, and now it is a great place to be. So, and it's it's fun to host, right? My daughter played hockey, and we used the Northeastern rink because there was a deal with the city then that, you know, Latin Academy girls hockey plays at that wonderful rink. And when you had suburban families come, and you heard them go, "Oh wow, this is Boston. Oh, this is a nice rink. You want, we want, right? I think everyone in this room wants our kids to have the best because they deserve it." But what frustrates me time and time again is we also have the money to do that. So if it's building a track somewhere else, if it's giving them access and paying and investing more than $76, I'll end by saying this will be my third budget season. I don't know where I'm voting yet, but I know the first two years I voted no. And my number one reason why I was the counselor that voted no on the BPS budget is their lack of investment. They talk about mental health. They talk about you know, well-rounded children, but then we don't put the dollars where it matters. We don't put the investment in making sure. And if it's not sports, if it's not track, if it's not swimming, it's arts, it's fencing, it's theater, it's everything else that we need to make sure we do. So thank you. I know we've had several conversations leading up to this, and I do just want to make sure that you, um, interim president, um, know, and everyone from Roxbury Community and the Reggie know that I think what you do is great there. But when you do have an article and 
it's exposed, you know, that kids are running up and down hallways and then there was someone who broke an ankle trying to open the door to run through and you hear these stories of kids feeling like, you know, the buses don't show up and they have to forfeit the first time in 40 something years, you know, South Boston High can't play their traditional football game because our buses don't show up to get them to the Thanksgiving mm -hmm. game. Those are things I'll continue to advocate for and I know my colleagues if not all of them will um, support me in that, making sure that our kids have the best because they deserve it. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, I'll now pass it over to Councillor um, from District 7, Tanya Fernandez-Anderson. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the time. Um, I was actually expecting um, the second co-sponsor to go first, but I appreciate the courtesy um, as a district councillor. Um, well, welcome and uh, to this uh, conversation. And uh, I, I, I guess I'm a little um, taken back now that um, the lead sponsor um, stated what she stated on record, um, because now it takes a curve about how we're going to support RCC or Reggie Lewis in terms of managing um, or oversight on Reggie Lewis with more resources. And I think that's where the conversation should go, um, since the um, the honus or the fault is not with RCC, is not with Reggie Lewis per se, um, but it is an issue overall throughout our school district um, as to not have providing uh, sufficient facilities. Um, and I agree with my colleague that um, to support mental health, you have to invest in uh, facilities that obviously um, have proven three times more impactful than any psychotropics or medication in mental health. So we need gym, we need uh, um, exercise facilities and uh, music and arts and all of these other um, specialties. So I don't necessarily um, have questions moving forward. I think I want to hear from the panelists uh, more about how we can be a support to you. Um, thank you for taking the time to go be in here and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Councillor. I'll now um, pass it over to um, City Councillor from District 6, Ben Weber. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and, and thank you, Councillor Murphy, for, for, for bringing this, um, and, and thank you all for, for coming in today. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, last week I, I, I looked at the, uh, the recent state track and field championship results. Uh, the media champions. We had uh, one state champion, I believe, from Boston, coached by Coach uh, uh, Lowska, uh, Iverka Paul, uh, who is a, th a weight thrower from the O'Brien. Um, she competed in the nationals th this weekend. Uh, and, uh, but it struck me that, um, you know, we have a very large school system uh, compared to the rest of the state. And it's hard to imagine that you know, uh, the kids are faster in, you know, Holliston than they are in Boston. So I, I feel like it speaks to uh, a lack of uh, access uh, to track and field for our kids here. Uh, and I want to figure out, you know, what's going on. And, uh, you know, certainly I, I, I ran track in college when the uh, Reggie Lewis Center was opened. It's an amazing facility. Uh, and um, you know, I'm interested to, to hear what kinds of scheduling uh, uh, issues there are, whether there's any coordination between the Reggie and uh, the indoor track at BU and the new facility that New Balance opened up in Harvard to make sure that our kids can get access to these uh, facilities. Um, because I think, you know, track and field is, uh, it's, I feel like it's the most egalitarian sport we have. You don't need to have had special training beforehand. All you need is you know, a pair of shoes and uh, the willingness to show up. And uh, I think it provides a great experience, uh, you know, for kids. And so I want to make sure our kids here in Boston can have that experience. Um, and I look forward to working with you and uh, to try to make sure, you know, that we, that we can support our, our kids and families here in Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll pass it over to um, City Councilor at Large, Julia Mejia. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and welcome. Uh, I, I am grateful to have you all here. I think when I first heard about some of the discrepancies, I think there was some miscommunication in terms of who 
um, and what we should be talking about. So I'm really glad that we are really unpacking this conversation here so publicly. Um, so I just wanna first acknowledge that. And I think after speaking with you, President, really understanding all of the things that were at play now gives us an opportunity to reset. So really happy that we're gonna be able to do that here. I, I think that um, I have a daughter who is an athlete. Um, she plays basketball, so she's not a runner. But one of my staffers was a runner. Um, Sarah Lawton was one of the track and field stars and uh, utilized that space. And um, I have really learned a lot about the sport, if you will, um, and understand the importance of having space for young people to be able to run around, if you will. Um, but, but I think as we continue to have these conversations, what I'm always looking for in the posture that I think is most helpful in this moment is really identifying what is the need um, from your perspective um, at the Reggie and what role do we play in helping you to support and filling in that gap. And I think that that is, for me, where my heart is um, and how we can utilize whatever resources we have here. I always say that Boston is resource rich, but coordination poor. <laughs> and I know there are a lot of other spaces and places that have not been up for discussion that potentially could enter the conversation that could potentially be other sites and spaces and places that we can use. Um, to allow our young people to be able to run around, right? So that the Reggie is one of many spaces and places, right? So that you are not the one who has to carry all of it. So I think that that is something worth looking into. Um, I think that, that that would be helpful. And then the last piece of the discussion is the resourcing of programming. I think that there is definitely an opportunity, having run my own nonprofit organization back in the day, I know there are a lot of orgs right now that are looking to partner um, and are looking for spaces and places to build their programming, and what better way to do so than opening up your doors and making sure that there are some financial supports um, so that you can offset some of those gaps that, that that you're utilizing and allowing folks from the suburbs to come through. So I think that Councilor Anderson's idea of looking at programming is a really great place for us to start thinking about how we can support those conversations, not just from a city perspective, but also like tapping into our own personal networks um, to be able to support that type of programming. So I'm here for problem solving. Um, and I'm um, happy that you are here to work alongside us to do just that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'll now pass it over to our um, District Councillor from District 3, John Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chip, uh, and thank you, panelists, for coming. I really appreciate your time. First, let me start off by saying uh, the Reggie has a very special place in my heart. It was the first place I worked uh, after graduating college. I worked in the, uh, the membership office and selling tickets to high school track meets. <laughs> Um, and I worked with, with Keisha and Curtis, the janitor, and um, who else was there at the time? Steve and a bunch of other guys, Mr. Keys. But uh, great memories there, um, and I always want the best for that facility. Um, I look forward to the questions uh, it, once we get into it, but um, I'll, we'll save it for that. But thank you very much for coming. I look forward to it. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you to all my colleagues for being here. I also like to acknowledge that this time um, we've also received a letter of absence from um, Councillor Coletta of District One, which um, the councillor has kindly asked that I read into the record. Um, Dear Chair Santana, I regret to inform you that I will be absent from the council um, for the hearing to discuss um, reclaiming the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center for our Boston Public School athletes on March 11, 2024. I unfortunately have a previous long-standing commitment in District One, but my staff is listening in, and I will review the recording. I would like to. I would like the record to know that I support Boston Public student Boston Public School students having priority access to the Reggie Lewis Track um, and Athletic Center. Kindly read this letter into the record. Sincerely, Gabriela Coletta, Boston City Councilor, District One. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors to begin um, with the first round of questions, and then I will turn um, the floor over to my colleagues in order of arrival. Um, for this round, I'd like. Um, I'd like to ask that each of my colleagues limit the time of your questions and um, panelists' response to seven minutes per council per councilors to start, and then we can um, do a second round of questions as needed. Um, I'd like to first recognize the lead sponsor, Councilor um, Aaron Murphy, to start with the questions. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor um, for seven minutes now. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I don't have any questions. My questions were going to be with BPS here and Avery being able to answer what opportunities we are providing. Um, so I guess we'll have to reschedule and you won't have to be back for that one. We'll have a hearing. I'll file a hearing to have just Avery Isdale and the BPS athletics here before we go into budget season to make sure that we don't hear after we pass billions of dollars, right? 1.7 billion to the school department alone that our you know, gym floors have buckles on them that we don't have adequate you know, equipment for our students. So looking forward to advocating for our students for, you know, going forward. Um, but like I said in my opening statement, for all of you here, thank you for what you do. And like I said, I'm here to support the Reggie Lewis Center in finding ways to um, expand it and any time we can include BPS students and in that, obviously that conversation is important to me, but all, all of the students that access, athletes that access your facility are important to us, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll now um, pass it over to Tanya fernandez Anderson, Councillor Tanya fernandez Anderson. sorry. Uh, no worries. Um, to all my people that speak Spanish, it's Tanya. Tanya, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> Not Tanya. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Um, I guess, so we have subpoena powers. Is the, the BPS absolutely needed for this conversation? Is the conversation needed with BPS? Are we rescheduling? I just want to understand what's the direction here before I go into my questions. Yeah, so I mean, we, we invited the panelists right ahead of time and these are the panelists that you know um, um, that showed up. So happy to have conversations outside of the right now, where you know just going Making with what we have. Yeah, got it. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Well, let's just get down to the to the math. What's um, tell me about the facility needs and where we are and um, the numbers uh, exactly? What are the needs and how can we assist um, Reggie Lewis? Thank you, Councillor. Um, first, uh, let me just say we really appreciate the support that we've heard from each of you and we, we want to work with you to make sure that the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center is open and available to as many students as possible, particularly Boston Public School students. We, we're in the middle of the city. We're committed to, to the Boston Public School students. Uh, one of the things that happened, as I understand the history, is that the you know policies influence how things shake turn. So when the Boston Public Schools changed the uh, school dismissal time for high schools, that changed the the availability of the Reggie for them. Um, what we have been told is that at one time the high schools all got out at the same time, so that allowed more time more students to have access to the center. Now different high schools are dismissed at different times, which reduces the time that, that the center's available to them. So we're looking for as many ways as possible to expand opportunity for all of the students. But we do have these track meets that start at, I think, is it 4 o'clock? 3.30 or 4 o'clock. 3.30 or 4 o'clock every single day. And many, some of you have mentioned the buses. It's amazing how many students come through that center uh, over the course of a year. 117,000 public high school kids will come through the center uh, during between November and March. So the center is heavily used. And that means we regret, we don't like our students to have to come at practice at six o'clock in the morning. I know my kids wouldn't want to get up at six o'clock in the morning, but that literally is the only time that's available for them. So if there are ways we can work together to look at you know, expansion of other facilities in the city, we'd, we'd be happy to, to work with you to, to, um, to do that. I know, Michael, you might want to talk about our relationship with some of the other yeah. facilities in the city. Yeah, and, and just to add to President Jacob Scott's comments, um, official practice for the, the state starts the Monday after Thanksgiving, and then it goes until the first track meet. 
So from the Monday after Thanksgiving, we start at 2 o'clock until practice is over. It's usually 2 to 5, and where everybody has access and plenty of time. This year, our first track meet started December um, 6th. So you have that Monday to December 6th until that first track meet where it's open, where everybody has access. Um, but when we start track season, we have two track meets a day, every day except for one day of the week. And, and I thank Coach Lasko for coming to one of my listening sessions because we did have a, a good conversation on how do we provide more time. So during the week, we have... Um, we when have do you not have meets? Excuse me? When do you not have meets? We don't. <laughs> you said except Literally, one day a week. So I'm, that's what I'm getting to. So one day a week, we have one track meet. So oh, every other two, day is two. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is two track meets. Thursday is one track meet. So with uh, Coach Lasko's advice, he's like, can we push that back later so we can have at least one day a week that um, we can have a longer practice time during track season? And that's something that we're definitely going to look at during um, while we're scheduling the track meets this fall for the 24-25 um, season. So Thank I appreciate you. that conversation that he came to listening sessions. And, and we did have the conversation. So we are having conversations with BPS um, coaches and um, administrators across the board. Um, since this article that came out in December, we did have uh, I did reach out to Tech Boston, who at that point in time. Mr. I Turner, not, thank you. Uh, Sorry, it's like literally five minutes and it goes like this. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so, okay, so you have basically every day it's being occupied and it just sounds like you need another Reggie Lewis, but have we had a chance to meet with BPS to explore their facilities or has this meeting taken place at all? To explore their facilities? No, we've been talking about not explored their facilities yet. Okay, um, is that something that I mean, you let us know if that's something that we can assist with. Uh, that's something I can definitely continue to talk with uh, Avery and Corey about and making sure I'm getting around to see their facilities. Okay, yes. thank you. And in terms of resources, money, what, what's, what are the needs there? What are the difficulties or how can, what, what do you need? I mean, the most, uh, need, the most important needs is the roof and the HVAC system. Um, the HVAC system is a 30-year uh, lifespan. We're on year 29, and it's, we've been dumping a lot of money into it recently just to keep it up and running. And if that completely fails and the roof completely fails, we don't have a building for anyone in the state to come and utilize. And that's going to be a, a travesty for us. Our track is on, also on its last leg. There's numerous holes in the track from the old bleachers that are outdated and burning holes in the track to move them in and out. So we need a new track, we need new bleachers, we need a new roof, uh, we need a new HVAC system. Um, it's totaling $20 million right now. And just two years ago when, when the president put together the Pathway Forward Committee, it was $12 million. So in two years, that same exact um, stuff that we need has jumped up $8 million. So it's, we need the funding. Um, we need more funding in our budget to house um, and run these meets properly. Because right now we're spending over $75,000 just in those three months to hire hourly staff to help us manage the meets. And we don't make any money off the track meets. We have over 100 track meets during those three months. And that takes a toll on our budget, which from my understanding gets the same appropriation when the building opened. So there's, you know, there's a saying that you know, the root of all evil is money, but money does answer all, all things. So you know, we need the resources with funding to help us out across the board. And have you connected with the state at all on this? Marta, maybe, maybe you can respond to that. So yes, uh, Councillor, we've been, since um, interim president Jackie Jenkins Cuss has been there the last two years advocating at the state level with um, our own representatives and senators, but also the legislature, uh, testifying at their hearings, uh, letting them know that this is a statewide facility um, that the whole state is responsible for and the state uh, should put money into the budget for deferred maintenance of the Reggie. We started that campaign two years ago. We're still, we've met with the speaker, we've met with the Senate president, we've met with the governor, we have met with DCAM, who manages all the buildings. Um, we've made a little bit of headway in the governor's office. Um, we had a positive meeting with uh, Speaker Mariano recently. Um, we've met with the Joint Committee on Education, uh, Representative Rogers. So we've done the rounds at the legislature. We're continuing to talk with them 
about, in particular, the HVAC system and the roof, the $6.9 million that's needed to repair those two things. You can't repair one without the other, um, and so those two things are critical. For the record, my um, son, I, I ran track, I attended O'Brien, mm -hmm. and I ran there at Reg Lewis. My son attends uh, MECO uh, school. He's in his last year, runs track, uses the facility as well. So I know for sure that these schools in the suburbs don't need Reg Lewis to practice, but they definitely use it every day, as you said, for on different track meets. Mm -hmm. So it looks like BPS students are using it as home, and everybody else is coming in. And I've, I know that firsthand. I know that for sure. So it's, it, I, I'm surprised at this point that we are, we have, a, we, we're using Melia Cass, so we displace students to the Reggie, which I support and on record, I'm very honest about supporting Haitian migrants that are for temporary use. But then while we're moving, the alternative became Reggie, or one of the alternative. And while we're doing that, we have a facility that needs help as is, and then we're adding more burden on top of that, all in one neighborhood, already historically disenfranchised um, Roxbury. So I look forward to supporting you with advocating with the state, um, and I think that there's some follow-up here that mm -hmm. I can do um, so that we can sit down and grab some meetings and talk about this, because the issue is here now, especially while we're using Melnia. How are we supporting Reggie and see where we go from there? Were there? That would be great. We really appreciate that. That, would, that would, that's an opportunity. The state budget is coming up now. That that's in process, and even though this is a tight fiscal year and there are challenges, um, this center is important to the whole state. And it's thirty. It, next year it will celebrate its 30th anniversary. And there's been no major investment in the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center for 30 years. Wow. Well, thank you so much for that information. That's all for my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Um, I'd now um, like to recognize the, um, the other co-sponsor, um, um, Counselor Ben Weber, for questions. Counselor, you now have seven minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, so, uh, I don't know, do, do any of you know how long a, an indoor track typically lasts? And it, it's, it's rubber, right? Yeah. Or, uh, some well, the surface that we have is a Mondo surface, and it's technically supposed to last about 20 years, but with the amount of use that we have on it, it lasts uh, seven to eight years. And we're at year nine right now. Okay. Uh, and... Um, I guess, so ha has anyone had c conversations with BPS about tra track times and, uh, and practices and, and uh, who did you talk to and what, what were those conversations like? It's, it's, like I said, uh, Coach Lasko, who's one of the coaches there, um, yes, we've uh, had that conversation. We've had the conversation with Avery. It's an ongoing conversation that we're going to utilize that information to schedule as best we possibly can, um, the track meets, uh, as we do have over 100 from December um, through March. So it's, it is a very tight window that we need to continue to have a discussion on how do we maximize the use for uh, BPS and everyone else in the state for practice time, because it's important to have the practice time in there as much as have the meets there. Okay, and then typically how long is a track meet? Three hours. So you, you, you usually do two a night, uh, okay, the, starting at four? The officials do a great job of, of um, going through the meet. So yes, they will start at four o'clock from four to seven, and then the next one will go at 7.30. We're clearing out the one, the one at seven, bringing new in at 7.30, and that goes to about 7.30 or uh, 7.30 to 9.30 or 10, depending on how the size of the league. Okay. Um, and. Does the Reggie uh, Lewis, does it generate any revenue through the track meets? How does that work? Um, the league meets, no. Um, because uh, the MSTCA, MIA are, are for profit or not, one is, is a 5013C and the other one's for profit, we do um, charge them for our staff um, to help maintain or to help run the meets. So, yes, they get a, a charge on the Saturday and Sunday meets that they operate. 
But is that just to pay the officials, the starters, and the people and, measure? And the hourly staff to help maintain the building. So it is, doesn't really cover the cost of running a track meet on those days. Okay. Um, and so has there, has there been any attempt to coordinate with other, other tracks to find spots for, for kids for practice? And it, uh, it's the attempt that we're starting that relationship. But we are, since we are a state facility that is mandated to house high school track and field, um, it's free for us. Any other facility they go to is going to come at a cost. And that's the biggest problem because even the New Balance track charges, uh, I want to say, $300 an hour for the use of their facility. Um, I don't know what uh, BU and Harvard charge, but it's my goal to get to those. You know, When I started here, track season was right around the corner, so that was, was our focus. But it's still my goal to, to build a relationship. We have four of the best tracks in the, in the country right here in Boston. So utilizing them to the best of our ability is, is definitely a goal. Okay. And Counselor, and could I just add to that? You know, while we're willing to support and be, you know, assist with that, that would really be, I think, something the Boston Public Schools would have to take on. To And, and you, city councilor, I would say, you know, the city council can say, you know, quite frankly, New Balance, what are you doing? Boston University, what are you doing? Harvard, what are you doing for our students? Uh, we're willing to give you all the data we have and participate as much as we can, but we don't think that's you know, frankly, to be quite frank, our responsibility to to negotiate that on behalf of Boston public students. Yes, I, I was about to say that I, I, I totally agree with you. I think that's something that, that uh, you know, would be nice to have uh, the athletic director here. Coach Lasco. Uh, hey, Amon. Uh, I think the, the pressure on the Reggie Lewis tells us one thing. We need another track. <clears throat> uh, and we would probably be, behoove us to have something for, to, you know, just the city kids. A lot of the suburbs have, they don't have to be fancy, they don't have to be huge, they don't have to be banked. A lot of them are only 160 meters around or 180 meters around, not banked. Uh, but someplace where Boston Public School kids not only have priority but have ownership, uh, I know that land is very scarce in Boston. Um, suggestion has been to put a bubble over the uh, unused track, 300 meter track at uh, English, English High School. High School. Uh, perhaps we should think about moving forward with, with that plan. Uh, obviously, there's way more pressure than we can handle with the Reggie Lewis Center and like that. Well, Co Coach, I just had a follow up question. Uh, um, so in terms of not using the Reggie, I think you alluded to some events like the long jump, the high jump, the, the, a weight throw you can't do in a hallway. Um, what kinds of, and it's been suggested to me that you know if we just invested in some high, high jump mats at different high schools, they wouldn't have to travel all the way to the Reggie. What kinds of equipment do you think we could invest in to allow access to these kinds of things you know, I think <clears throat> at the schools themselves? See, at the John D. O'Brien, for instance, uh, there are three basketball courts. Uh, typical basketball practice, JV on one court, varsity on the other. <clears throat> and the third, people who just hang on. I've suggested in the past that we put a high jump mat and a net to throw into in the third uh, basketball court and been told by the athletic director at the school that basketball has priority uh, and there's nothing he can do. Whereas a, a divider net or a divider or separating the third basketball court and using that as a place to, you know, use a, make high jump practice and throws would be something we could do. Uh, take some pressure off, and I'm assuming that a lot of other places could do the same thing. Uh, just, you know, just at the local at the local level where I'm at, uh, that's something that could be done. If you went to OB, you know that what I'm talking about the three gyms and. Uh, one divider and that if you've been to basketball practices i've been there is the varsity the junior varsity and then the boyfriends and girlfriends that are you know, <laughs> shooting in this in, yes shooting in the third basketball uh, court uh, that could be used okay coach th th well thanks i, I appreciate <laughs> that uh and, and, and thank you everyone uh for your you know thoughtful responses uh chair i'm sending it back to you Thank you, Councillor. Um, before we continue, I'm, I am going to continue with um, 
uh, with my council colleagues from question. I just want to acknowledge that uh, we've been joined by um, our council colleagues from District 8, Sharon Durkin, and then also our council colleague from um, District 4, Brian Morrell. I'll give you um, both a moment to just share opening statements, but after this first round of questions. Um, just continue, and I'll turn over the floor um, to my other colleague for questions in order of arrival, um, Councillor at large, Julia Mejia. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this, I'm really glad that we're having this conversation because this is where we learn what we need to do differently, right? Um, and I am a big proponent of accountability, and I know that in the pilot program, we have a lot of universities who are doing business here in the city of Boston and not paying their fair share of pilot. Um, and there is an opportunity there for us to have a different conversation with them in terms of what it looks like when they open up their doors to um, city kids or even the, the kids from the suburbs, right? So I think that there's, there's a role, whether it's use or financial supports to help improve the quality of uh, programming that exists at, at um, the Reggie. So I think that there's, there's a way to engage them. I think that there's an opportunity there um, for us to invite them to participate in such conversation through the pilot program. I also believe in private-public um, partnerships, right, because we can't expect um, you all to carry the, bear the brunt of this, but I also think that there's an opportunity here for the city now we're entering budget season, right? BPS is going to be coming in front of us for their budget. I think some of the questions that we should be asking is how many dollars are we allotting towards helping for facilities improvement for spaces that the city um, kids are utilizing, namely the Reggie, as, as an example of what that could look like um, as an investment. I also think that um, when you, we talk about $300 an hour to use um, some of these spaces, and whereas you all are free, am I? Correct. Mm -hmm. Am I? Yes. Y'all are not charging. Well, do the, we I know you can't because of that, but, but. We can't for high school track and field. But other folks are spending, are charging $300. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that there is something there that we need to unpack a little bit further in regards to how you all, it feels like, have your hands tied, right? You can't charge. Yes. Um, they're, they're not providing you the types of funding that you need to be able to fix your facilities but yet there are other folks who are operating and charging $300 an hour, and still yet some of the young people who live in other parts of the state are opting to use this, obviously, because it's free, but they have the budget to be able to spend money elsewhere. Just help me just understand clarify, that. I think we just need to clarify in terms of the high school track um, meets. Different from practice time, we don't charge for that. We just have no space for practice time, literally. It's very little, very few hours available for practice time, two to four mm -hmm. every day. Uh, unfortunately, on the weekends, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., th those are for practice times. So if someone wanted to rent the Reggie, for something else, we do charge for that. And one of the things we're asking the state, because this is a great facility, we have a cap. We can only take revenue of $559,000. Anything over $559,000 goes back to the state in the general fund, which means that there's no incentive for us to rent the Reggie for more than $559,000 a year. So the governor is proposing significantly raising that cap. That's something that you can support, and we would ask you to support. Um, to, I think she's raising it to $2.5 million, which means that if we could rent the Reggie when it's not being used for track, because that's the, the priority, but there, you know, there's eight other months in the year that we could really rent the Reggie out. For example, last weekend we were able to rent the Reggie to New Balance, frankly, and we got a good amount of money for that. If we could do more of that, what we would want to do is to put that money into programming, put that money into building improvements. The Reggie is an old building now. It's 30 years old, and we know when a building is more than 20 years old, it starts looking 
old, I hate to say that, but it starts looking its age. So we need ways to increase revenue. But for the high school track, we are not allowed to charge money. We don't charge Boston Public Schools money. We don't charge the, the suburban schools money when they have track meets. But other, for other purposes, we can, we can rent the building, whether it's the gym or the, the field house or other parts of the building, that we can charge for. And just to note that the meet this past week was, was great, and um, New Balance did donate um, two BPS schools about $11,000 worth of track spikes that they were literally just wanted to give away. So that was facilitated this weekend through the New Balance track meet. Um, so we are doing whatever we can to partner and continue to help BPS in any way possible um, with the resources that we have. Right. So I, I have, and it's, I'm just going to ask because I think that these are the, why we have these hearings is so that we can better understand all of the things that are at play because you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if, um, for example, Wellesley, mm -hmm. if they can afford to spend the amount of money that they need to for practice and for their meets, is it fair to say that they can use um, Boston Landing Track and Field Complex or New Balance as opposed to the Reggie? Or is it the way that the, the dynamics is, is that because it's statewide is that you will, that's the compromise, right? That you will allow these schools outside of the city of Boston to be able to utilize the field. So, so they don't use the Reggie for practice. For, for track meets, excuse me. They don't use it for practice. No, for they just only for, use it for track meets. Right. But if we can just encourage them to go do their track meets somewhere else, <laughs> you can't, right? That's it's what I'm a trying, statewide it's track a state, right. association. So what, what I'm trying to do is help the people who are following us to understand, and my time is up. Um, I self-time myself here. But what I'm trying is this, I want people who are following to understand what why can't we just make this equitable and make it fair for students who, who we're here to advocate for? And I think if they can hear you all spell it out, then people sure. will understand what is the conflict. So, so just track meets are different from track practice. I mean, there's the expert here. But track meets happen pretty much five days a week. And as, as Mr. Turner said, two big meets each day, five days a week, from 4 to 7.30, and then from, from 4 to 7 and 7.30 to 9.30 or 10. So those are track meets. We cannot charge anything for track meets. Practice, the, the kids who need to practice for a meet, that's the issue right now for, for Boston Public Schools. They don't have enough space or time to right. practice. Right. So the problem that we're trying to solve is the reason why I was asking is why not then have the kids that are doing their meets and the Reggie go spend $300 at the New Balance Fields? There, there, is, there is a handful of <laughs> leagues that have opted out on their own to take advantage of the New Balance track. I don't have that data, but I know that they do host a handful of uh, high school league meets at New Balance, but they get charged there at that facility. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm always trying to find the happy medium, right? Like if somebody has, they should be the ones that are putting up the most and making sure that those who have not. And the Reggie already, with, the, with the, um, the wear and tear of these folks who are coming here and they're, you know, you're not able to make a profit, if you will, or charge, it's unjust because then you are having to keep up with the maintenance and, and you know, the, the equipment. I think that there needs to be some way that for us to reconcile all of, the, all of that. Yes, so. we agree. Yeah, so we're here <laughs> to support, and I just want you to know, you know, I know Councilor um, Anderson has been a loud voice alongside, you know, our colleagues here on all things that deal with her district, so if there's a resolution that we need to file in support of what's happening on the state level, we're more than willing to, at least I'll speak for myself, I'm more than willing to do that, um, because I think that I'm glad that this conversation is happening because that informs how we choose to support and move forward. So I, I appreciate that to time, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll now hand it over to um, Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you. Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, 
So just a couple, of, and you guys might, maybe BPS would be the per people that would answer the questions I have, but I just want to state them anyway and, and see if we, just for uh, some baseline answers. Um, do we know how many schools have indoor track teams, at least BPS schools? I'll, I'll limit it to that. Do we have any idea how many BPS schools have indoor track teams? Um, I have it on my computer, but the number is... <laughs> Is, um, Let me see if you have that in my. Or ball, I, I, mean, I would say ballpark if you can. I know you. Yeah, I don't want to misquote that. Yeah. Thing, so. No, understood. <laughs> understood. Um, but my, my my line of question is how many how many have indoor track teams right that actually have the need for the use of the Reggie Lewis Center? If so, how many of those schools are using the Reggie right? And to thinking about practice time and where we fit. Um, and of those schools that use it, how many of those schools cannot make it between two and four thirty? You said two to four, I believe, President. But I, I, I was remembering two to four thirty was practice time. But is that no longer the case? I don't know if it's stated, it's stipulated elsewhere that it's different. It changes from the open practice from from the Monday after Thanksgiving to the first track meet is two to five, and and longer if needed be for practice. For practice, right? Once track season starts and the meets start at 4 o'clock or 4.30 or sometimes 3.30, we can only go from 2 to that 3.30 or 4 o'clock time frame. Okay, understood. Um, I'm sorry, Coach. Uh, yeah, so you asked which teams can use it. The time when we have it till 5 o'clock, pretty much all the kids in the city, I think there's like maybe eight or nine track clubs. That's what I thought. Track teams in the city. Once we break it down again, I want to stress, at least half the time it was 3.30, not 4 o'clock. I know because they yelled at us on the microphone to get out at 3.30. Uh, that being said, pretty much the only two track teams that can actually practice are Latin Academy and uh, uh, O'Brien, uh, mostly because Madison Park didn't have a track team until this year. Mm -hmm. But we'll say they, they just started one, so there would be three schools that are close enough to get to the track to actually hold a real practice once practice is halted at 4 o'clock or 3.30. So that leaves out probably about four or five of the schools that have track teams. And one of the things that, that, what, one of the things that happens when we do that is their track teams tend to be very small yep. because they really don't feel like they're part of it. I guess I don't know what the real reason is. But the other schools, Madison, um, uh, O'Brien and uh, Latin Academy have huge track teams. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the schools, not so much. Uh, uh, Tech Boston is getting to be a, kind of a, a bigger team now. But for the most part, they're relatively small. And all you have to do is look at the results from the city track meets and, and count the points. And you can see uh, where, the, where the, the students are. Yeah. Thank you, Coach. Um, and so I know that, so out of those four or five that can't make it right during that window, uh, how many of them were affected by the, the change in departure time? So I know Superintendent Chang changed a couple. I know Tech Boston specifically, but I don't know it, uh, off the top of my head how many others were affected due to the, the, the change in departure of the school time to get to the Reggie, to, to fit this two to five practice time. If, if for, all, I can, all I can talk to you about is what kids show up. You know, it's like uh, at the beginning when uh, uh, Michael was talking about how we had it till 5 o'clock, we, there were two shifts of, of athletes that came in. Uh, the, the local, the close by ones would be packing up to leave around 4 o'clock. And then there would be another group of like from Tech Boston or uh, a couple, you know, of trying, to, trying to remember the names of the schools. But yep. there would be another, another shift of kids who would show up down at the throwing circle. And it would be okay. Shift number two, and uh, and that shift ended whenever we started actual uh, track meets. That shift didn't happen any longer. Uh, for what? And there are, by the way, Tech Boston has some really, really fine potential in there. You know, there's a uh, little, a little, I mean, little, because I'm old, uh, boy who's like a sophomore who's just huge, and, and he could be yeah. great. But I never see him. Yep. Right. No, understood. Um, I, if you can't tell by looking at me, did not run track. Uh, and so I'm wondering, how many days a week do you need to be? How, do, how many days a week does an indoor track team need to be practicing on an indoor track? For me again, uh, 
Well, it's for any, anyone who has I did, any familiar. Uh, Michael could answer that too, probably. Uh, uh, you know, we have one day that's a meet. I would say that ideally, ideally it would be all week, but ideally at least uh, one more day so that the athletes from, say, Tech Boston yeah. or New Mission could a access a long jump pit, which is no matter how you do it, you can't make one of those up in a school. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, the high jump, and we have a throwing circle where we can actually throw live throws. Uh, so I would say minimum one more day, uh, ideally all five. Uh, yep. I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be upset if there were, you know, we have meets on Wednesday. If Tuesday and Thursday were also days that the kids could stay until 5 o'clock so that the kids from the other schools could get in yep. uh, like that. Uh, and then, again, high-level athletics requires you know, seven days a week. You know, sure. So, what, what I'm trying to justify is, is how, many, how many of our BPS schools are you – know, what, what is the, uh, the track amount of time required? How many of schools are using the Reggie? And how many are conflicted by their departure time versus them either just not showing up? And do we actually – is there enough space for, for folks to do it? If departure time was different, would there be enough time for folks to do it? And it, if you only need to do it, say – practice three times a week on an indoor track uh, and the other two times back at the school or something like that, um, is there, does it open up enough slots for people to have enough time? I'm not saying I know anything here. I'm just trying to recognize where there are opportunities and if there is actually make sure that the demand meets what we, what we are opening up here. Tradition, traditionally, track teams can share a track. Right. You can have as many as four or five different track teams training on the same track. Uh, occasionally, people growl at each other for using sure. the wrong lane, but usually it's it's very you know amicable between t uh, coaches, and they can so and they can figure the, it. Out. The time, the opening time on the track wouldn't really affect which schools could come and use it because no matter hey. how many come, they would obviously be able to accommodate. Thanks, uh, the people that are there. So I just said I know my, my time is limited, but I want to get to the the operational side as well. Thank you for answering all the track questions. Um, I do recall, when I worked there, I thought we sold tickets to the high school track meets, but I'm, from what I'm hearing you saying, we do not charge for high school track meets? They sell tickets to, for the MSTCA weekend, Saturday and Sunday meets. Those but not days. during the week? No. Interesting. Okay. Um, have they ever done that? They, they, so they used to, because I used, I mean, I, unless I was pocketing the money, I don't remember, <laughs> right? Like, I remember taking, selling tickets to, to no. high school track meets, um, and I believe that was during the week, but I just want to, if that changed, when, when did it? That, yeah, that was a, a change in policy fairly recently that was implemented. So that was up until um, at, at least 2016 that, and, that tickets were sold during the week. Why did that change? A response to a state audit. A response to a state audit. Gotcha. Um, and, and by pushing the, the only other concern I have, and sorry, Chair, is we're looking at, to, to get more BPS time, we're looking at pushing some of these track meets back to a later time, right, to allow practice to occur. Uh, but that would mean that some of these folks that come from all over the state, being a state facility, wouldn't start their track meets till much later, and therefore three to four, three hours, three and a half hours for a track meet, you're not getting done. You're, you're leaving the Reggie at 10:30 and driving back to Cape Cod or wherever Western Mass or wherever you might come from, right? I just want to caution, and I think about this as as because we want time for our BPS kids, but it is a state facility, and the rest of the state uses it. And I don't, wanna, I don't want the Reggie to bite the hand that feeds them, right? And saying, sorry, guys, we're pushing you back further. And them saying, well, we'll go find elsewhere or we won't reinvest. It seems like they haven't reinvested much anyway, and we need to advocate for that. Um, but still, what's the point? Um, thank you. I'm done. You're right. Right now, we have two times from 4 to 7.30 and then 7.30 from 4 to 7 and then 7.30 until 9.30 or 10. So if you're on Cape Cod or even if you're in Wellesley, if you're leaving Boston at 10 o'clock, you're not, these kids aren't getting home until 11, 11.30. Right. I don't know how they determine who gets the later um, slots. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably um, determination on proximity to the Reggie, so they're not getting home so late. So that is yep. part of the, the process of scheduling. Yep. Just wanted to bring it to the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'd now like to give the opportunity to um, um, Councillor Durkin um, to give um, opening remarks, and then if you want to also um, 
you know, ask your um, fair questions there. You have seven minutes. Thank you, Chair Santana. I've lost my voice, so I'll keep this short. Um, I think track is the perfect sport. I ran for six years, did discus, hurdles. I did. I love track and field. Um, I think it teaches the perfect marriage of personal responsibility and team efforts, and I think we want everyone who attends our Boston Public Schools to have access to track facilities and track because um, it's a sport that just really, I mean, it, it, so many, it fits so many different body types, it fits so many different types of people, um, and it just, um, I personally, former um, captain of my track team for two years, so I'm really proud, and I wasn't the best athlete, but, um, but it was all about who could really bring the team together, and so it's not lost on me that now I'm a Boston City Councilor, so leadership was a little bit, um, I was learned all of those skills at doing track and field, and um, you know, the Reggie Lewis isn't in my district, but a lot of, is used by a lot of folks in my district representing, um, you know, the West End to Mission Hill. Um, so, and I know that there are a lot of programs that go on. I want to shout out Heartbreak Running Club, who I think are just incredible athletes and an incredible program. Um, and obviously the senior classes, which I think it's so incredible. And so there's so many different aspects of who's using it, but I'll try to um, keep my questions to what's happening, um, you know, in regards to this hearing order, which is about BPS kids using the Reggie. Um, it sounds like there hasn't been a lot of investment over the last 30 years. It's something I'm happy to add, you know, my name to and whatever efforts and whatever the city council decides to do to try to put our um, backing behind um, creating some space and some energy for continued investment at the state level. Um, and I think with the creation of more tracks, it lessens, um, you know, it lessens the amount of pressure that's put on one facility, which I think is really important. Um, you know, it's obviously the Reggie's 29 years old, so you're dealing with like everything under the sun um, in terms of uh, facilities issues. But if there's one thing that we could advocate for as a city council, um, it sounds like the removing the cap or, or upping it to $2.5 million is something that you'd recommend that we advocate for. Yes. Yeah, the governor, um, we worked with the governor's office, and she, in her budget, increased the cap to $2.5 million, which is something we support, absolutely, because it allows us then to um, uh, rep generate more revenue during the year, and it, it, it won't go back to the general fund uh, up to that amount. Got it. And um, I think... I look forward to advocating with my friends and colleagues at the State House. Um, I think this is so important. Um, I think my uh, colleagues have asked some great questions, but in terms of HVAC and all of those investments, I think um, you know there needs to be greater study and um, greater um, cooperation. So I'm happy to you know add my name to anything that you guys are trying to do. And I think um, as we move into, sorry, I'm just. I have no more voice, so I'll, I'll let you guys go, but I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to hear from my colleagues. Councilor, I would say we're happy to <laughs> send you and the other councilors the recent assessment that we uh, had made on the building, which it's now just under $20 million that's needed. We're not talking about per, what I call prettying up the building. We're talking about essential services, HVAC, lighting, the things that have to be done. So if you're interested, we're happy to send that assessment over. You have a summary of it, I've been told, but we, we're happy to get you this, the assessment. Thank you. And I actually have seen sort of the innards of your building because I was um, helping advance uh, the vice president when she was here. So I got to see all of the not so pretty parts about <laughs> a with Secret Service. So I've, I've seen the innards of the building. I know that there's a need for investment, uh, but it was a wonderful, I have some, because of that and, and other experiences at the Reggie, have some great memories there. And I think we're just looking to create more memories, especially for our BPS kids there. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. And I really appreciate the time you're taking out of your day to, to brief the city council on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'd like now to um, offer um, each of my other colleagues um, five minutes for a second round of questions. 
Um, I'd like to start with the sponsors and then the recognize um, our other colleagues in order of revival. Um, beginning with the lead sponsor, Councillor Murphy, um, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. Um, just reminding everyone that for many of our BPS students, when they do get to the Reggie for a track meet, it's the first time they're actually running right on a track because they've been practicing elsewhere. Many of the questions and comments from my colleagues just continuously reminded me that BPS should be here for this conversation, mm -hmm. that they should always show up um, when we ask them, but especially when it's such an important conversation where we have a room full of colleagues who made sure they found the time to be here. You all made sure to find the time to be here. And from what I'm hearing from all my colleagues, we're here to support our athletes, right, our students. We're not here to, um, you know, even if we were, it wouldn't matter, right? So I, I really don't have anything more to say other than what has turned into what Councillor Durkin said, a, a briefing to the city council, but this was not at all the intention when I wrote the resolution in December when that article did come out, but have been hearing for years now about and being a mom of student athletes and BPS and know that we always struggle with facilities, but just this conversation needs to continue. So I will be filing a hearing order to discuss just athletic issues directly with BPS, but know that um, I have all your contacts. Thank you for being so open up to this point, and I'll continue to be in contact with all of you to make sure that you're supported going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll now um, pass it over to Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Councillor, uh, through the Chair, uh, Councillor Fitzgerald, um, if it's okay with you, the Chair, um, you, did you ask if for indoor track fields? You said how many indoor track fields in BPS? I don't think any. No. Oh, teams, okay. Yeah, sorry, how many indoor track teams, now that you can hear me, um, were across in BPS, and therefore, and then how many were using the Reggie, and how many were affected by time? So I'm sort of trying to limit down to understand what schools are actually going to use it or be able to use it if we were to accommodate in the best way we could. Okay, thank you. Yep. And did we get the answer on, they use it for, for meets, not practice, right? And therefore, we don't charge them? Those that are able to make the practice times, use it for practice, and um, BPS held Before eight, meets or other days? Before meets and during track season. Um, and, but you don't charge suburbs? We don't suburbs. charge anyone outside of the MSTCA and MIAA for their weekend invitation. Sorry, days. acronyms. Who, who, who the are they? Massachusetts State Track and Field Coaches Association mm -hmm. and the uh, Massachusetts Intercollegiate Athletic Association. Okay, thank they, you. On weekends. Weekends, just, they just do, yes, they just do weekend. Those two organizations only have, have meets on the weekends unless at the cha during championship week, the MIAA did host a division meet, championship meet for each division, one through five, and the New England um, championships for all six states. Okay, thank you. Um, so you have $20 million of repairs to make and your um, obviously, you, whatever your revenue doesn't wouldn't cover that, and you've already reached out, applied for grants, um, which you did not get, um, or all of what you anticipated or wanted, and or needed. Um, and we've talked about collaborating with state partners to move forward and advocating for more resources, funds to make these repairs. Um, I just want to make sure that we're on the same page walking away from this and we've also talked about uh, bringing BPS to the table to talk to them. I mean budget season is coming and they they know that um, and I mean I, I anticipate that they're going to say the same thing. You know these are the projects that are on the way of repairs and things like that but I think a separate meeting not necessarily a hearing to talk with the superintendent and say where, can, can we look at what's available and what are your schedules in each facility?
to be able to share spaces that other um, teams can, can use and other groups can use. Um, outside of that, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Dr. Jenkins Scott, is that we should be, um, the honus is on us to advocate with um, private entities like New Balance to be able to say, what are you doing for Boston? I actually do have a hearing order already written um, specifically asking um, outside colleges and universities, um, how are you um, taking responsibility outside of pilot, but they don't actually meet the um, promise that in the pilot, never mind the pilot. Um, and on top of that, I think that they've caused so much harm that we subsidize their uh, buildings, their, the land, mm -hmm. um, and that they don't pay tax. And then on top of that, they are not um, educating our black and brown and working class students. Um, and on top of that, then they don't contribute. So it's almost like they just commoditize our communities um, and take and take and take. And we are left with a bunch of students who are, that are not going to their schools, that are not using their facilities, um, and they continue to just you know use and consume. So um, looking forward to collaborating with my colleagues so that we can set up a meeting with both private um, uh, schools, being nonprofits, and uh, BPS so that we can have those conversations and advocate. I think that's where we're landing right now, and hopefully with further conversation, um, we'll figure out what the next steps are. Thank you. Thank um, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll now move to um, um, Councillor Julie Mejia. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I'm on the BPS website right now and looking at, you know, their departments and who are their partners. And we have Boston Centers for Youth and Families. This is an athletic partners, Boston Parks and Recreation, Bar Boston Scholar Athletes, Dream Big, Play, um, Play Ball slash Boston, Special Olympics, Massachusetts. And I think that in the spirit of this conversation, we have an amazing opportunity to um, invite other partners to join BPS to help with this. I don't think that it should all just fall on the Reggie. I think that there's an opportunity to expand that list um, and to create, and to create um, a, a dialogue in which we're looking at our um, higher ed institutions, some of our nonprofit partners, um, and you know, even some of our charter schools. They, they have space as well. I think that we, we need to look at every single space that exists here and, and figure out how we can meet the moment so that it doesn't all fall on the Reggie. And I think um, I'm not one to just hog the mic just for the sake of hogging the mic. You've been here. Um, the next conversation should be with Boston Public Schools um, just to kind of see where we can reconcile some of these gaps um, and just count on me as a partner alongside y'all to advocate for the dollars that you need to be set up for success. Um, so I, I don't have anything other than just gratitude um, and looking forward to being a big mouth and helping <laughs> y'all get those dollars that you need to make sure that our kids get what they need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll now um, pass it over to um, Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chair. I uh, just want to thank you guys for coming today, for the great work you do, the services you provide, uh, no matter what times you provide them, right? Uh, and uh, thanks for coming. I have no further questions. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Durkin. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you to the lead sponsor, um, Councillor Murphy, for um, this was a really helpful conversation, and I uh, really appreciate your time and for everyone for being here. I um, also want to call out um, to my colleague, uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, thank you so much for your conversation about pilot. Excited as the Vice Chair of Pilot um, with a lot of the institutions that could absorb some of this um, in my district would love to have further that conversation around how we can make sure that um, we're getting everything we can from our institutions and so that um, not all of our conversations about what one finite resource but how we can support all of our kids through a lot of different types of athletic facilities when there isn't you know necessarily going to be capacity at only one uh, but appreciate everything that you guys have done to to attempt to accommodate so many shifting schedules and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, um, we will now move forward with public testimony. Um, when your name is called, please come down to one of the 
two podiums and state your name, neighborhood, and organization um, affiliation. Um, please speak into the microphone and please speak uh, and keep your comments to two minutes. I believe we have um, someone who's going to testify um, via Zoom, um, Sean Neon. You have the floor, two minutes. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, teacher here at the Condon. Um, actually, it's kind of interesting you mentioned uh, the aquatics because I am the swim teacher slash PE teacher here. So I'm actually hiding away from the fumes because they're literally relining our pool right now. And uh, I am the, also the track coach, one of the track coaches at uh, proudly the oldest school in America, Boston Latin School, and um, we have one of the top 10 programs in the state the last two years. Uh, we won our conference in the DCL, and I, I said as much, I'm kind of late joining. I, I didn't know what the process was going to be to actually sign up, so I tried to get on as soon as I could, but um, when a colleague of mine said that it was at 2 o'clock, um, kind of just going back to the time issue there, well, many of us are in school still teaching at 2 o'clock. <laughs> so. My school doesn't get out till 3.20. Um, I race over and we have practice at 3.30. Um, so that's, you know, maybe a, an issue for me personally uh, with the time. But to be honest, um, for years and years and years at Latin school, we have been able to have practice. Uh, so really until last year, this was news to us when all of a sudden there were two meets scheduled. So one thing that's not really being explained is if there's no incentive to add financially to add more time for meets, then why were they added? And why were they added? Which essentially by adding them, you subtracted BPS. You subtracted a bunch of schools uh, that used to practice every year at, you know, whatever. Even for us, 215, we get out 215. It's going to take us 30 minutes just to get the kids over from Latin. And we're, we're one of the closest schools, and it takes us that long. So um, not to mention uh, the many other schools. I mean, East Boston, I don't even know how they would get here. Um, but like, I think that um, I feel like that's been missed in a lot of what I've said, and there's been a lot of niceties, which I, I understand. And I understand RCC is a partner, and they're great, and the Reggie Lewis is great. But I want to just comment that really the issue here is that we used to have some pra we used to have practice time, and then that time was taken away. And then we went to New Balance and begged for time, and they were like, yeah, it's $300 an hour, but sorry, uh, it's full, and we're, there's no time for you. We, we were like, we'll, we'll practice at 9 o'clock at night. So my, and, and guess what? It's filled with a bunch of schools from the Burbs, Weston, Waltham at New Balance. So we were too late to the game, I don't know. And so I just feel, we feel left out. We feel a little bit like robbed um, that we are one of the most successful programs and we have a hundred kids every season. So I know there's gonna be some issue with maybe some of these schools have smaller programs, but I agree 100% what my friend said. You know, if you make them sprinters try to practice out in, on ice on the track, uh, they're probably not going to want to come. And they're probably not going to stay on that team either. And they probably won't rejoin next year either. So um, if they knew that, oh, I signed up for indoor track and it's actually outdoor during, during the, the cold. So um, I'm, I'm really proud of my team and the kids and everybody. And, and it's all about the kids. And I'm proud of my kids here at the Condon. And just, it's, gosh, I'm trying to create opportunities for these kids, and right now I feel like it's such a frustrating battle. I've been a nonprofit organization, track, Town Track Club in Charlestown for 13 years. Um, we can't hardly ever get our own track there, and because we're fighting with these, frankly, rich suburban uh, lacrosse and soccer leagues, and we can't get on our track. So. <laughs> I thought finally I was ready to get, be out of this mess and I, was, I, I stopped wasting my energy on these fights, but now I feel like my energy, my, let's say my Irish has gotten pushed way back up again this year and I really feel like some of that isn't really being uh, mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, appreciate that. Um, um, and just want to now you know, thank, um, again, my colleagues for being here and thank really um, you all, um, the panelists, for being here and taking time to, um, to answer our questions. Um, with that, um, the hearing on docket number 01. Oh. Come on, come on down, please. <laughs>
please um, just state your name um, and organization that you're affiliated with. Right. Yeah. This one? Yeah. yeah. No, no. Thank you for being here. All right. Let me do this as quick, as quick as a track meet. Um, sorry, my phone's. All right. Ready? It's me against the clock. Let's go. Thank you for having this public hearing here today. My name is Melissa, and to quote Shakari Richardson, I'm not back, I'm better. I'll get right to it. I am a Boston native, resident, taxpayer, and a Boston Public Schools graduate. As a student at the John W. McCormick Middle School, I ran track at the Reggie Lewis Center. Though I realized, thanks to my middle school physical education teacher, shout out to Ms. Holland, that badminton was actually my favorite sport, I was grateful for the opportunity to explore my interests and find out, sorry, what I was good at, as well as incorporating regular physical activity into my everyday life. Upon a decidedly fast transition to admission at Boston Latin School, go Wolfpack, I still found myself at the Reggie Lewis Center, this time as a participant in Boston Ballet's Taken Steps dance class. As a participant of this class, I gained confidence and expanded my artistic practice by incorporating kinesthetic uh, mediums and movement. I'd like to emphasize the importance of having facilities with programs that encourage physical movement and exercise, especially as a preteen and an adolescent girl experiencing changes physiologically, puberty, am I right? And where I was physically situated. Eventually, I'd go on to work my first job at age 15 as an office clerk at Jose Mateo's Ballet Theater in Cambridge, completing a work-study program to pay for tuition for my ballet classes. While I didn't parlay the track meets and dance classes I took at Reggie Lewis into a stint in the Olympics, I was able to gain insight on my tactile kinesthetic learning style. Kinesthetic or tactile learners need to physically touch or try something in order to learn the concept best. Kinesthetic learners use body movement and interact with their environments when learning to better understand something, need to touch, feel. Hence, practical information is usually preferred over theoretical concepts. And I applied these skills when I would change the scale of my academic essays, when I would walk around and I would move dry erase boards um, on wheels uh, as a crucial strategy of my college coursework uh, while I was studying at a college that rhymes with Schmarvert. Speaking of Schmarvert, there's Harvard Stadium in the neighborhood of Alston, the Boston neighborhood of Alston, with a wonderful track, Make Harvard Help. If they can host the Latin and English Gridiron Classic on Thanksgiving, then surely the Reggie Lewis Center can enter into a partnership and access funding between Boston Latin and Harvard Unity's exorbitant endowments. It has become tedious and cliche to feel obligated to advocate and support access to facilities and programs in the city of Boston, particularly Boston Public School students and alumni. It is as tedious and cliche as this very governing body and that brought in the Eagle Room. Thankfully, the very stupid plan of moving the O'Brien School in West Roxbury has been thwarted. For now, as this public hearing proceeds, so does a lawsuit in Suffolk Superior Court. As Councilor Murphy noted, $76 per student is being spent on Boston Public Schools athletics. My taxpayer dollars and yours are being expended so that the city's legal department can defend a lawsuit against the mayor of the city and others. Apparently, it was not enough for SCOTUS to unanimously rule that the city violated the United States Constitution. Now the white stadium issue has the plaintiffs alleging that the city of Boston is violating the Massachusetts state constitution. How efficient. As Councillor Mejia noted, Boston is resource rich and coordination poor. I'll add that time is a more valuable resource than even economic capital. Time is a non-renewable asset. You can get money back, but you cannot get time back once it's spent. Boston as a city needs to collectively understand that the time taking away from the use of the Reggie Lewis facilities, particularly with our Boston Public School students, is time wasted and time misspent. Time and energy that those same BPS students might parlay to say not getting into trouble and causing a ruckus in downtown Boston, for example. Boston Public School students, staff, graduates, and Boston as a whole needs to reckon with that time and how it's being used. And I close with what's Carrie Richardson. It's me against the clock. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we also have one more person signed up, Mark McDonald, for public testimony. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, no, thank you. Um, well, with that, I, again, want to just thank my colleague, want to thank all the panelists for joining us today. Um, and. Um, you know, just being us uh, answering our questions here today. Um, this, hear this hearing on docket number 0177 is adjourned. Thank you.